Hi everybody, it is five o'clock and we are going to kick off Quartic Leadership event with myself, Emma Tamplin, and our amazing guest speaker, LaShawn Lindsay. First things first, hi Sean. hi. hi. Uh, first things first, I just want to do um, a quick technical check with you. So those of you who are not familiar with GoToWebinar, I just want to run through a couple of checks. Um, you'll notice an orange box at the top right hand corner of your screen with a white arrow. Uh, if you click on that white arrow, it will open up the webinar toolbar, which you can use to interact with us today. And when you're not using it, you can just click it again and they'll disappear. Um, you will be able to see myself and LaShawn, but we're not going to be able to see you because we've got such a large audience with us today to minimise any sort of disruptions. We've muted you and hit you, hit, turned your cameras off, so uh, apologies for that. But if you do want to send any questions, if you want to ask LaShawn any questions during today's event, then please pop them into the questions tab in your toolbar, um, which you should be able to find there. And any problems, let me know. Um, you can also use the question facility tab as well if you're experiencing any difficulties in hearing me or seeing the slides. Um, if you have any problems, please drop my colleague Alexia May um, an email. Her email address is on the screen right now. It's Alexia May at quartig.com if you are unable to see the slides. Um, we'll also be recording the sessions as well so that you can, you know, you can watch it back. Um, say you're making loads of notes or you know for those who are not able to join us today you want to pass it on to them absolutely go for it. So I'm Emma Tamplin, I'm the collaboration manager at Quartig and I am responsible for managing a number of exciting initiatives for women, girls and women and girls such as leadership and I also work closely with businesses in Wales to create flexible workplace structures to support the progression of women in the workplace and I'll be your host for today. So Quartig, for those of you who are not familiar with Quartig, we are the leading gender equality charity here in Wales. And since 1992, we have been working to ensure that women can enter the workplace, develop skills and build rewarding careers. We have a vision of a Wales where every woman and girl is treated equally and is fully able to participate in the economy and in political and public life and live safe from violence and fear. And at Quarity, we offer a number of services that can help support girls, women and businesses across Wales. And we also work closely with decision makers and government in Wales to ensure our country is fair and inclusive for women and to ensure that they have a platform for their voices to be heard. Um, you may not be able to see this very clearly, but this is our manifesto for a gender equal Wales. And you can access this via our website at quarity.com. This is our asks to achieve a gender equal Wales and um, it maps out our vision for the future. So please go check it out. It is a really great, um, great manifesto. So quarity leadership. Here we are. Um, leadership is one of the many great initiatives that we offer at Quartig, uh, providing women with the opportunity to role shadow incredible women in a variety of leadership roles across the sectors in Wales and beyond. And we want to make decision making roles in Wales to be, you know, we want them to be gender equal, we want them to be diverse and representative and able to serve the people of Wales. So we've come up with the leadership programme. Um, to do that and pre-pandemic our leadership program would usually look would usually provide participants with the opportunity to role shadow female leaders across the sectors in Wales and beyond and um, across the sectors in sectors such as this um, the assembly in politics in public and political life um, across the public sector and across private business leaders as well um, and usually our participants would be able to meet up with the leader, go into their place, place of work, discover what being a leader means, how they make decisions. You would get to meet the team, have a tour of the workplace, go to events, go to meetings, really have a day in life experience. But sadly, you know, in the, the situations that we find ourselves in, we have moved leadership online and bring in um, amazing women with incredible careers right to your, uh, to your well through virtually to your homes so today i am so thrilled to be joined by the powerhouse that is michelle lindsay calling all the way from washington dc and i know if this was a real 
live face-to-face -face event, we would be giving LaShawn a massive Welsh welcome with a lot of whooping and yahooing and all sorts of noise flying around and clapping and cheering and stomping. So um, it's really difficult to do that virtually, but LaShawn, just feel, I hope you can feel the vibes come in your way because I, I know everybody at home will be as excited as I am to have you here today. So thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, LaShawn Lindsay is the current director of uh, infrastructure at Amazon Web Services and was also the former managing director at GE Aviation uh, Wales and the first woman to hold the position in the history of the company as well, which is an amazing achievement. And during her first two years at GE Aviation, the number of women on the shop floor rose from 1% to 13%. LaShawn uh, also founded the Wales branch of the GLBTA GE Aviation GE Alliance. Um, which was developed to attract, develop and retain gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender employees across the company. LaShawn has also recently been appointed one of the, th the first three envoys uh, by Welsh Government to promote Wales to countries abroad, which is fantastic. Um, so welcome LaShawn, are you, how are you and are you ready? I'm excited. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I mean, it's always humbling to to get a request to come and speak to such a talented group of of, uh, of, of females inspiring to you know lead and and grow their careers so many many thanks for the opportunity and i am totally stoked i'm pumped um you know we won we i'm still in the we mode uh we wales rugby we won this past weekend we beat ireland we're gearing up to beat scotland so it's all goodness at this point Brilliant. I absolutely love the fact that you've worn a Welsh rugby top to uh, to leadership as well. Really, really channeling your love for Wales because I know that you hold Wales quite close to your heart. For sure, definitely. Oh, brilliant. And I have to mention this is this was a record-breaking event for us as well, with a record number of uh, bookings for the event and for attendees. So yeah, it just goes to show everybody's just dying to know you know your story, you know your your past, your future, and your, you know your, and your present as well. And and what's next for you. So awesome. let's kick awesome. things off. Let's go okay. right back to the beginning. What inspired you to become an engineer when when this was something you were interested in? Was this something you were interested in as a child growing up in Rock Hill, Southern California? Okay, so um, actually what inspired me to be an engineer is, um, and it's, it's Rock Hill, South Carolina, so it was in the South. But oh, it was interesting, Emma, because um, you know, growing up, in South Carolina, Rock Hill, I didn't have exposure to a lot of different professions, right? My dad was a shop floor employee. Uh, my mom's a stay-at-home mom. And so I really didn't even know the engineering discipline existed or what it meant to be an engineer. So I was always good at, you know, growing up, I was always good at fixing stuff, right? Fixing things um, more so than my two older brothers just uh, tearing things apart, putting things back together, figuring out what's wrong, um, going out, helping my, my grandfather uh, build houses. So I was always that hands-on, let's figure it out, fix things. And then in the background in school, I was always strong, super strong in math, um, math and science. I loved chemistry, um, excelled in it. And so as I you know, grew up through school, you know, it was really my teachers that said, with your skill set, um, your love for math and science and fixing things, you should be an engineer, right? And then at that point, I was like, what's an engineer? And so the more I researched it and got exposure to it, and even when I went to Clemson, I can honestly say I wasn't sure, 100% sure what engineers did, um, but I knew my teachers told me that you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be great at it. And the more I learned about it, that's what, that's what pulled me into, you know, into the field of engineering. Amazing. So that's where it all started for you. And I know that, you know, you moved on from being an engineer and held a number of leadership roles across, you know, US government and within many private companies such as General Electric Company as well. What does being a leader mean to you? Yeah, so um, you're right. I mean, even, you know, before, you know, before I went to GE, before I did, you know, the private companies and work for the government, I had leadership roles, you know, when I was in school, um, you know, student body president, you know, Spanish club president, pep club president, president of everything. So I just always had this affinity um, to lead people. And when I'm talking to people about leadership, you know, you can Google it and it's going to be a laundry list of all the leadership traits and characteristics. But I just summarize it. I try to keep things simple. And I say, you know, leadership for me is around total ownership and responsibility, right? 
that sums up leadership for me. So as a leader, I look at it and I say, hey, I'm responsible and I own my team. So it's up to me to make sure they're developing, they're growing, I'm guiding them, coaching them, motivating them, right? And then I look at the goals, right? So I'm responsible for execution on those goals, setting those goals, setting that vision, setting that strategy, making sure that everyone has clarity as to where we're trying to go. And then the customer, right? We're all working for the customer. There's a customer somewhere at the at the end of all this great work that we're doing across the world. And for everyone in their job, there's a customer. And so I'm also, I also own that, right? I own that customer experience. I'm 100% responsible to ensure that our customers are, you know, having a great experience when they're buying our products, using our services. So that's the way I, that's what leadership means to me is total ownership. You know, it's my being responsible for it, <clears throat> owning everything, you know, not throwing my team under the bus, not blaming my team for mistakes. Um, just being that, that guiding light, that, that uh, North star that's responsible for those elements that I've discussed so far. You talk about, um, you know, be it, being, a, being a leader and also leading teams. How would you describe your leadership style or how would your team describe your leadership style? Like, do you think that they're the same kind of answers or? I think so. I think yeah. so because, um, you know, the thing that I, when I'm, when I'm looking at my leadership style again, you know, you can go out and just do all this research and many books have been written and there's just so many answers on leadership styles and types. And I always tell people, and I think my team, you'll get different answers from my team because I say that my leadership style is adaptive and situational, right? I don't think that anyone is one of those different styles. I think that the best leaders, they know how to flex those styles in certain situations, right? So that's why we say mine is adaptive and, and um, situational. So it's very important for me, you know, sometimes um, I have to make the decision, right? So sometimes there's a democracy and we're all voting and we're like, yep, let's get buy-in and let's go team. But sometimes there's one vote and it's mine and I have to know when, you know, it's one vote and when I need to get buy-in from the team to, to move forward. Um, sometimes it's, you know, a servant leadership model when I'm just there to support the team, you know, picking up the team as we're, you know, as they're falling down, making mistakes, coaching, developing. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just, hey, we, we have to, we have to go execute. But so I say that, you know, leaders have to be able to flex his or her style, depending on the situation that they're in. And so I think if you talk to my team, you'll get some kind of hodgepodge of all those different things, because that's just a result of, you know, being able to change my leadership style based on the situation that I'm, that I'm facing. You mentioned about having to be able to flex depending on the situation that you find yourself in. So would you say that your leadership style sort of um, evolved over the years, right, you know, when you first became a leader to, you know, the role that you're in now? Definitely. Uh, you know, I tell people um, about careers and leadership and skill sets. Um, it's a it's definitely a marathon and not a sprint. Right. So I'm definitely a different leader than I was um, 30 years ago or maybe it was 40 years ago when I first got my definitely not 40 years ago when I first got my first leadership role. Um, I tell people, look, I started when I was two years old, so ex so I'm exactly 32 years old now. So uh, the child labor laws were different back then, but you know, on a serious note, I look at it, um, and you know, as a leader, certain things you start developing as your as your career progresses, or you should emotional intelligence, right? You know, making sure that you aren't reacting to situations, you're not being an emotional leader, you're not getting upset, that you're having the patience for your team to make mistakes. Um, Th those are skill sets as a leader that you develop, you know, as your career progresses. And, you know, sometimes I look back, you know, many, many years ago and I say, wow, man, I did that or I said it that way or I couldn't communicate well. But definitely, you know, I've grown into over many, many years, you know, being able to be that situational leader and figure out, you know, which style I should use, you know, depending on the situation that I'm in. And I think, well, I think everybody at home is probably wondering about how do you, how are you a leader, how do you lead a team during a pandemic? And I know that you joined Amazon Web Services right smack bang at the start of the of the pandemic. So how has that been for you, and how do you find being a leader virtually? 
it's been challenging, right? Um, I think it's challenging enough to to be working from home and as a leader and having a team that's you know spread out, but then you know changing careers right in the midst of a pandemic, uh, relocating, uh, having to learn a totally different business, totally different team members, a totally different function, totally different industry. Um, you know it's been challenging, and so what what I'll do with my teams is you know first. The first thing I do, no matter whether it's virtual or whether it's in person, I have what's called get to knows, right? So I have to get to know the folks on my team to figure out what motivates you. You know, what do you like? What's your working style? Um, what are you concerned about me? You know, what do you know about me? And just go through and just trying to build that informal relationship with the team. And um, it's harder to do that virtually. You know, when you're one on one, you can kind of gauge people's body language or but on camera, you can't. And the other thing with my with me is like I'm really motivational, right? I love to, I'm the cheerleader. I'm high fiving, and you know we can't do that high fiving anymore and all that stuff. But that's just my style, and it's easier to do that stuff in person and motivate in person. So now, you know, some of the techniques I'm using virtually is I'll do you know virtual clapping and virtual cheering and virtual high fiving, and definitely we'll use you know the chat box to say way to go, great job. And then just making sure during team meetings, you know, I'm gauging everyone and pulling everybody in to make sure that, you know, we're not being exclusive because we're using, you know, technology and not being able to pull in our team members um, like we can when we're sitting in a conference room and we can see whether people are engaged or whether, you know, we're leaning into different people to get different perspectives. Yeah, it's just, it's just been, yeah, it's difficult for us um, working at home. But it's completely changing your job, relocating, leaving all your friends and family behind, you know, I, I can imagine it's been quite the challenge for you. Um, I just want to rewind slightly. Sure. You became the first woman to become the uh, managing director of GE Aviation in Wales. What did that mean to you? Well, you, you know, it's, it's interesting, Emma, because, um, you know, when my boss came to me at that time, I was in Boston. I was leading um, our aviation shop, New Make Aviation Shop, engine shop in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And when my boss came to me and said, hey, I want you to go to Wales and this is why and boom, 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 boom. And this is what I need you kind of do. And you go figure it out. Um, at that point, I really didn't know that I was going to be the first female managing director of Wells. So that's not, you know, it's not why I took the job. So it was only once I got there and we were in the midst of planning our 75th anniversary. So it was 75 years of that site not having a female managing director, noting that it was um, the largest industrial company in Wales, right? So you kind of just sit back and say, wow, for 75 years, there's not been a, a female managing director. So it meant the world to me. It really did. And um, I just took ownership of it. And I said, look, I'm going to be the face of the site and I'm going to be the face of women in leadership. And so I took it seriously. Right. It didn't become, you know, one of those certificates that I got to hang on the wall and just say, ha ha, I was the first uh, female managing director. And it didn't get to become like something that I got to put on my resume or, you know, in LinkedIn. I really took it and I said, look, I am socially responsible to make sure that women realize that it can be done. And so I just took it um, to heart and went out and just started, you know, working very, very hard to tell the story of the site, to tell my story. Because I think that as you're growing up, right, it's hard to be first, right? It, it really is. The barriers, the obstacles that, you know, people face when they're first at anything is daunting. But when you can see that someone else has made it, it just gives you this whole different perspective and motivation to say, well, LaShawn did it, I can do it too. So I wanted to get out in the community to make sure that every little girl in Wales, especially where we were tucked in the heart of the Welsh Valleys, knew it's possible. You know, I can go and be managing director of GE Aviation Wales because LaShawn from South Carolina, right, was able to, to come over and do that. And so I'd say that it meant the world for me and I really took it to heart and did the best I could to, to go out and tell the story. I absolutely love that. And you know, this is at the heart of what, what we do at Quarity as well and why we've created initiatives such as leadership and not just for boys is 
that we can have visible female role models that we can tell that story and, and just sh show girls at home that they can aspire to be anything regardless of their gender and their backgrounds and wherever they are. So yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love that. That's amazing. Thank you. And I'm just so pleased you were, you were here with us tonight. Um, who do you look to for inspiration? What, who got, is there anybody or any one person or do you have role models or mentors that got to you to where you are today? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's interesting because I don't have, I don't have a one person that I look to for inspiration. What I do is I really look at characteristics that inspire me, right? And I affiliate, affiliate those with people. Um, because we're all flawed human, human beings, so it's hard for me to just say, hey, that one person. So the way I look at it, and I think about it, Emma, is I say, you know, being black, gay, female from South Carolina, you know, again, the first, you know, people who've overcome hardships, persevered, those are characteristics that inspire me. For example, you know, I think about the gay rugby referee that just has done a phenomenal job of just representing us in rugby as a ref and just knowing the bullying that he's endured, the harassment that he's endured, the 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 slurs that he's endured, I admire him because I know that he's had to have thick skin, right? He's got to have that thick skin where it's just like I'm focused on doing this and I'm just going to persevere and get through it. And then I think about, you know, another characteristic, I think about all the first females, right? The first to referee in the NFL, the first coach in the NBA, um, the first executive uh, in corporate America, the first executive, you know, in this, the first person to do this, the first female to do that, the first one to put a crack in that glass seal, and the first African-American and Asian VP of the United States of America. And I look at all those first, and again, the characteristics that I look at, again, it's just that that perseverance, because you know to be the first, to be the diverse first, just the experiences and the obstacles and barriers that they've had to overcome, and to just pick themselves up every every day, you know, in the face of all that adversity and say, I'm going to keep going forward. That, that inspires me. And then I think about um, that amazing civil rights leader that had a dream well before his time, right? Who would have thought that back then, you know, someone can articulate a dream so powerful, way ahead of it, way ahead of his time, and in such a controversial time where you're talking about, you know, integration, breaking down the barriers of segregation, all of us working together, because you know that that's someone who was just so proactive, looking so far ahead seeing around the corners and seeing what the possibilities were, that's something else that inspires me. And then I think about, you know, these, this washed up quarterback that was told, you're too old, um, you're not good enough anymore, and goes and wins the Super Bowl this past weekend with a totally different team. Because, you know, being that age, I just go, wow, that's inspirational because he had to have just focus and discipline, focus and discipline you know, to just get through that situation, to be able to, uh, to be able to, to, to accomplish, you know, something like that, to be the first to accomplish that. And then last but not least, honestly, you know, Emma, I think about my mom, right? The characteristics of a mom, you know, to be, my mom grew up in the foster care system in South Carolina as an African-American female from the time that she was uh, two years old. And, you know, I think about her in the sense that, you know, I think she, I think she produced three amazing kids, you know, one probably more amazing than the other two. But um, I think she just produced, you know, she, she amazing kids. And the characteristic there is, you know, just that determination to continuously learn and grow herself so that she was a better parent to us than she ever had growing up. So those are just some of the examples um, of what inspires me. And again, I look at those characteristics that I can relate to. And that's what, ins so instead of just names, for me, it's more about those inspirational characteristics. Thank you, LaShawn. I, I, I know you've mentioned about diversity and, and I know equality, diversity and inclusion is so important to you. And, you know, during your first two years of GA Aviation, you grew the number of women working on the shop floor. You created, you know, the, the GLBTA 
GE Aviation Alliance. And I just want to know a bit more about why is equality, diversity and inclusion so important to you? And why is it important to you as right. a leader? Yeah, you know, for, you know, the textbook answer that, you know, people give on that that question is just around, you know, you look at the, the company, right? You look at, you know, people will say, and it's common sense, to me, it's the common sense stuff, right? Where we know that if you have diverse teams that you're going to get better ideas, right? Because you're going to have a better chance of getting the viewpoint of your customer base, right? So you're going to have diverse ideas. You'll probably be able to innovate better. Um, and you're more productive because when employees can feel like they can bring their um, his or her whole self to work, you know, they're going to be happier. They're going to be more productive. So that's to me, that's the common sense stuff. But honestly, Emma, for me, the reason why it's so important to me is, you know, I am African-American, female, gay from South Carolina, coming through corporate America, being the first to do this, first to do that. And at the end of the day, I know what discrimination and intolerance and unfounded hatred feels like. And it's important to me more on a personal level because I never want anybody to experience the things that I've had to experience in my career, in my personal life. And I think that if I can just make the environment better for just one person that doesn't have to, you know, have the, some of those negative memories that I have, then it's worth it. So I will continue to fight day in, day out, just to shine that spotlight, continue to shine that spotlight on, on um, inclusion, diversity, equality, and equity for that very reason. It's personal, you know, it's very personal to me at this point. And that really does come through as well. And, you know, your passion for technology and your passion for equality, diversity, inclusion just really does come, come across. And just want to know, does tech play, can, can tech, play a part in driving forward equality, diversity and inclusion? It can, right? I mean, ultimately, the human beings have to change behavior and, and move the needle forward through action, uh, strategic action. But, you know, the thing I say about technology is a lot of times when you go, and I'm sure, you know, the, the participants can relate to me, you know, trying to get diversity data is unbelievable, right? And I always say that, you know, with technology, with data lakes, the analytics, you can actually, there's no reason why companies can't provide that data at this point. And we've got to lean into uh, technology, analytics, and say, and hold companies accountable. Because I always say, look, the first step in making progress is admitting you have a problem, right? And the data will show you have a problem. It'll create a shared need. It's um, it's very easy for people to be in denial when there's not the data to say, hey, we have a female problem, we have uh, an African American black problem, we have an Asian problem, and you just go GLBT, LGBT problem, you go down the list. When you put the data forward, you can't argue with that, right? And you've got to be able to also cut that data to show intersectionality, right? You got to be able to show black female, black male, you know, you got to be able to show white. Uh, gay, white, lesbian, all this stuff, because that intersectionality creates a whole different environment for us, right? I mean, just for me, you know, there are stereotypes for being black, there are stereotypes for being woman, women, and then you put them together, and you just have, with that intersectionality, the stereotypes for African-American females are just crazy, right? You know, we're, we're, um, we're emotional, we're bullies, we're intimidating, you know, all of those negative things that, you know, people just don't, don't want on a team. And so for me, you've got to be able to have that data, those analytics to be able to show, look, we have a problem. This is our intersectionality data. We're not hiding anything. And I think that, you know, technology has to be on the forefront of just helping companies um, have a single source of truth when it comes to their diversity data and, and moving that needle forward so that you can start taking action on it. And that is definitely lacking in this day and age. Absolutely. And we do need to have an intersectional approach to the interventions that we have as well. We need to understand the different layers of oppressions that women face. Um, and we can't just have a one size fits all approach in tackling the, these issues either. So I think that's a very important point to make. Um, I just want to remind our audience at home, they can ask LaShawn any questions that they want to. If they want to pop them into the questions tab. I know I'm hogging her all to myself and being a bit greedy, but I will share. Um, so if you want to ask any questions, please pop them into the questions tab and uh, myself and Alexia will keep an eye on those and we'll ask those as they come through. Um, so 
So I have, I do have some more questions for you, Lashawn. I could ask you questions all day, actually. Of course, it's not a problem. <laughs> um, what in your career are you most proud of to date? Well, wow. so much to choose from, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I think there's a couple. I'll, I'll talk about. Um, I think I'll talk about you know personally, and then I'll talk about probably a work accomplishment. You know, for me, I think. You know, when I was in when I was in GE, I had joined this organization, um, and it was really a program. You know, it was it was it was it was a program where you know you either got promoted up or you got promoted back into the business, and it was a financial program. And so, very few engineers ever made it all the way through, right? So you generally did two years, and then you got promoted out, and then if you got promoted up, you did another year, and then again out or promoted up to the next level, and so. When I joined, you know, the odds of an engineer making it through a financial program was slim to none. And I actually joined to learn finance. I knew that I had a skill set gap in finance. So I joined that program. And um, at, when I joined, the program's over 100 years, right? So we have these crazy numbers, 75 years of AV, GE Aviation Wells, no female <laughs> managing director. And then um, this program is over 100 years old. And there had never been an African-American female that made it all the way through, right? ever in the over 100 years and i was the first as an engineer to get through that finance program and so you know seven years of my life i spent most of it outside the us but um i got i got through it and so i'm proud of that and honestly the last step you know it's always your choice to keep going or to come out the last step i said no right i wanted to go back into the business at that point and um i was convinced that i should stay and go through it and looking back on it, Emma, you know, I think that's when I said, look, my career at that point became more about others, other diverse people um, going to start breaking down some of those barriers than it did myself. Because if I hadn't, if I had said no and I hadn't done it, then it would have taken about, I think it was about five more years after me to get the second and only African-American female through that program. So I think that that personally, that's probably what I'm the most proud of. I think um, from a work accomplishment, it's really the well site. I mean, it really is. I just beam with what we accomplished there. You know, um, at the time, I think, you know, the future of the, of the site was really, really teetering on whether or not, you know, we could get our cost down, our quality better, our safety better. And that's why I was like really sent there. And there was that engine called the GE 9X, right? The future of, of, of travel, the future of aircraft travel, aviation travel. And um, we needed to win that. We need to win that um, engine to overhaul it, and we need to prove that you know we had operational excellence, and we could be the GE shop that serviced that engine. And um, lo and behold, it was tough. But in my second year, my at the end towards the end of my second year, um, we 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 did everything we were supposed to do, and all the announcements came out that you know our site right there in the, the heart of the Welsh Valleys would be overhauling that engine, and it just safeguarded at the time, so many jobs, the future of that site. And so from a work accomplishment standpoint, that's definitely, you know, what I'm most proud of. Thank you. Do you know what, what's happened now? I've, I've asked the audience for some questions and the floodgates have literally just opened. Oh, that's, um, awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. So brace yourself. I'm ready. Let's, let's have um, it. <laughs> there's lots of um, there's lots of questions actually um, asking you about how you know how did you thrive in a predominantly male environment? So your time at GE when you were a, um, and during your engineering days as well. Um, so one I think oh we've actually got a question from Haley, your your friend Haley. Um, Hi Haley. <laughs> you <laughs> your rugby pal. But wants rugby to know buddy. what 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 challenges did you face in changing the culture within a male dominated environment? In relation yeah. to equality, diversity, and inclusion, you know, it's um, I think it's for any of the you know any of the diversity. So it's the contra, right? Well, it's female and men, gay and straight. You know, it's it's always that you know you always run into that barrier of, you know, people thinking that one, there's not a problem, right? Hey, there's not a problem, and um, two, um, that you're taking something away from them, or three, you don't belong, right? So as I went through in these male dominated environments, the first thing that, you know, some people, not all, right, but the naysayers would say, oh, LaShawn's there as a diversity play, right? You're only there because we need a black female, right? 
Well, then they found out I was gay. Well, hey, you found me now. We needed a black gay female. So that's why LaShawn's here. So it's always that, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, prove that you belong and always being doubted that you actually have skill, skill sets, competencies, leadership skills to actually have that job and have that role. Um, and then, you know, just from the, the first one that I talked about, it's just around, you know, making sure that people understand that there's a problem, right? It is statistically impossible to not have diversity. So when you're at a company and it's all this or all that, hello, people, that company has a problem. And so to get people's heads around the fact that there is a problem and it's not just because, well, we can't find women, LaShawn, right? Oh, it's not culture for women to do this type of role, LaShawn. You know, so you face those barriers where it's just denial. And you really just have to, like I said before, bring forth the data and get on the recruiting team to say, hey, cast a wider net. There are people out there, there are women out there who want to do these jobs and have a training program to develop these skill sets um, to get, you know, to get these folks on board. And then the one about, you know, we can't do this diversity stuff because we're taking something, you're trying to take something from me and give it to someone else. That's always the response, right? You're taking something. And what people need to understand is it's just about equality, right? Nothing more, nothing less. We're trying to just have an even playing field to say, look, <laughs> we're not taking anything from you to give to me. We're just trying to have an equal playing ground for everybody, right? Where we can all succeed, where we can all realize our potential, where we can all just you know, add value to the company and, and grow and help the company be successful. So I'd say that those are some of the, the barriers that I faced in a male, you know, in a male dominated world. But um, ultimately, these things can be overcome as, as plenty, plenty of people, plenty of the first, you know, have shown that they couldn't be done. Brilliant. Thank you, Sean. I'll take a few more questions from the audience now. Um, a really good, interesting question. What is the one book you would recommend? The one book? Yeah, um, are you a reader? I am. And, you know, it's, um, it's not a leadership book. And I'm just going to plug it because it's, it's 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 really hard for me to find a book that's like life changing for me. But there's this book called The Toyota Way, right? The Toyota Way, and it talks about you know how Toyota, why Toyota is the best company like in the auto industry, best um, and and many elements because of the way that they develop and implement it lean, right? Lean six segment, which is just lean practices, is just around continuous improvement, and I just drew so many parallels to that with my team because it's really about saying, you know, let's push down ownership, you know, of processes day to day to our teams, right? Culturally, let's have a culture shift where our employees are coming in every day and they're going, hey, I can improve this. I can make this better for the customer. I can make this part better for the customer. I can make, I can do this safer. And so it was just that really, that mentality around, you know, changing culture empowering employees, continuously improving, even continuously improving yourself every day. Kaizen is what they call continuous improvement. I just got so excited by that book. And um, that's the one that's, that's, really, that's really, really stuck with me, honestly. I recommend you read it. It's not a leadership book, though. <laughs> it's one I haven't heard of before. It's very interesting. I definitely have to look that up. Um, got a few more questions from the audience. A really great question, actually. Um, but what advice would you give your teenage self? Wow. There's so much that I can tell my teenage self. Um, <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> I was, uh, I would tell my teenage self, honestly, Emma, I'd say change nothing, do nothing differently. Right. Because for me, I, um, you know, I look at life and I just think that every experience, right? Like life is really, when it's all said and done, it's about, it's about experiences and memories, right? that's what life is, is about experiences and memories. And so even, you know, mistakes I've made or things that I would have done differently, I always say, well, I wouldn't have done it. I would have done it the exact same way because maybe the dominoes wouldn't have fallen the way that they've fallen for me, right? And so I would tell my teenage self, stick to your guns and do nothing different, right? Because um, I've made some bold decisions that you know, people have frowned upon and said, you shouldn't do that. You, you go that place, LaShawn. Well, if you spend most of your time outside the U.S., 
you know, you'll never get promoted or you'll never do that. And so I just tell myself, you know, stick, stick to do nothing differently, stick to, you know, your personal values and what you set out for yourself and continue to just pursue your passions and, and just continue to, to make sure you're happy and, you know, in the jobs that you're doing. I love that. Absolutely no regrets. I, you know, I absolutely agree with you. It does shape you know, the person you end up becoming and learning from um, from failure as well and, and experiences that help to shape the people that we become. Um, we have another great question. Wanting to know, have you ever suffered with imposter syndrome? Um, and if so, how would you tackle this? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, any... I think that a lot of people, there's different, you know, different types of syndrome, imposter syndrome for sure. And the thing that I always say is be confident in yourself, right? I always say that you can't, you know, you can't let naysayers and people make you feel like you don't belong or make you feel like you're not good enough, right? So I just say that for me, I always tell myself that, you know, imposter syndrome, I always tell myself that one, I belong, right? I definitely belong. And there's no skill set that I can't learn, right? We can all definitely, definitely learn. And um, I always tell people also, like, don't lose confidence in yourself. So I've experienced, you know, all of those things that you guys can, you know, can, can, can uh, chat about in the group. And I just say that, you know, for me, it's all, it's been about focus and perseverance and always realizing that, you know, I definitely belong where, where I am. Brilliant. Thank you, LaShawn. I know that uh, many women actually feel like they suffer from imposter syndrome and I think men do as well. It's about how we uh, overcome that. Um, another great question. What strategies did you use to increase the percentage of women at GE from 1% to 13%? What worked and what didn't? Okay, um, so it was interesting. Um, you know, when I got there, I started in 2015, 2015, and um, I talked. There's a there's a BBC interview where I talk about you know some of this, but you know it was just amazing. The team was kind of nervous because they didn't know me, and I was kind of nervous because I didn't know them. And so the first day they took me on a tour of the shop floor and came back. We're in the conference room and everybody's beaming. What did you think, Lashawn? What do you think? What do you think? And the first thing I said is I said where the hell are all the women? That was my first response, right? I just said, where the hell are all the women? And um, that's when I started getting excuse. The, the excuse is right. Well, you know, women don't want to do these jobs, LaShawn, and it's not cultural and wells for women to build aircraft engines. And so I talked to my HR person. She was new as well, and she was awesome, awesome partner. And I just said, look, this is crazy. Women build aircraft engines in the United States of America. Women can build aircraft engines anywhere, tear them apart, put them back together. And so we started talking to our recruiting team and, um, you know, we were using a third party recruiter. And the first thing that happened was the third party recruiter was just coming up with all these excuses as to why we didn't have women on our shop floor. LaShawn, they don't exist. This is our recruiter telling me these things. So these are some of the barriers that we face. Um, they don't exist. You know, women don't do these jobs. We can't find women to do these jobs. And so the apprentice program for us was the feeder program into the shop floor jobs. And so we just became very purposeful, right? And just said, and that's where my phrase cast a wider net came from, where I just sat there and I just told our recruiter, I said, cast a wider net. I said, you're crazy. There are women who want to build aircraft engines and we have an apprentice program where we teach women how to build aircraft engines and tear them apart. It's not like you have to have that skill set coming in. We have a three-year program to teach you that. So cast a wider net. And so we could not get traction with that recruiter. So we changed recruiting companies and gave the speech around casting a wider, a wider net, right? And so we were able to partner. And, and when I say cast a wider net, right? Cast the, the net wider. That doesn't mean you change the mesh, the mesh size in the net, right? You don't change the standards. You got to still hold a high standard and get qualified, competent people. You know, some of the worst things you can do with the diversity is just bring in people who aren't competent just, just to make a number. And so we did that. We took on that strategy. We became very, we started looking at our, our apprentice program to figure out, you know, screening. Were we having any biases in there? Were we, you know, were we unfairly bringing people on, you know, taking people out um, to get on that program? And so we were just very mindful on the way that we started recruiting people and bringing in apprentices and we cast that, that net much wider. 
and then over time, you know, we were able to we were able to do that. So it was awesome. A lot a good success story for sure. That's a great legacy to leave behind, isn't it, Lashon? Um, I have a question about. Yes. I don't know if, if if this is even possible, but how would you describe your weaknesses, and ha have they hampered your progress at all? Yeah. So um, I think you know, personally, sometimes I'm very impulsive, right? You know, it's like high energy, passion, and sometimes you just want to go. It's part of emotional intelligence. You just want to go do something, right? You just want to act. You just want to react. And so that's one of the personal things that I've that I've worked on, you know, for for years, improving and making sure that you know you're listening, you're spending enough time to get all the information, to assess the situation before you start, you know, you start reacting. And then from the hard skill, so that's the soft skill set. From a hard skill set is really around, you know, just technical, right? Learning the business, you know, learning cloud services and and, and cloud computing and you know data centers and all those things and you know, the way I'm addressing that is just just learning, reading, listening, talking to the team, you know, going out, you know, as much as I can in the midst of a pandemic to to see it. I'm a very visual learner. So it's important for me to be able to go out, see it, touch it, you know, touch it and um, and learn from that standpoint. So I'd say that those probably are the two, you know, soft skill, hard skill things that that I'm working on. Brilliant. Thank you, Michelle. Um, another great question. Would you recommend taking risks in your career? Have you taken any risks? And um, we know that women are very risk averse and that can sometimes hold us back. So has that ever held you back at all or are you just straight in there? I think early on, you know, I, I see it a lot with women, honestly. So I think, you know, I've taken a lot of risk in my career, you know, changing functions, you know, being an engineer in the finance function, the program that I talked about, um, you know, changing, you know, moving, moving from South Carolina, joining, you know, moving from the government to private companies to, you know, G, GE, and then, you know, moving from GE to, uh, to, to Amazon Web Services after 23 years in GE, right? So those are all career risks. So I do think that women, um, and not all, um, definitely are harder on themselves when they don't have a skill set to do the job, right? So what I see is I'll see men, um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll post a job and a man will come in and be like, I can do that. Well, you don't have the skill set. I can do it. I'll learn. And then women, you know, you may even just go say, hey, I want you to, are you interested in this role? And women sometimes will give you a million reasons why they can't do it, right? Well, Sean, I don't have that skill set. Well, I don't know finance. Well, I don't know this. Well, I, you're asking for this. I've never led before. And so I do see that, you know, that, that mental that mental shift between um, men and women um, sometimes when it when it comes to taking a risk and getting out of your comfort zone. And so what I tell women is, um, and I tell myself too, is like, look, we all have to get comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, in life and especially in our careers, because you have to take a risk and go. And if there's, if, if you want to progress, right? And I always say, look, if you want to progress, then you've got to be willing to address your skill set gaps, right? And sometimes that may mean going into an industry that you know nothing about and learning it so that you're a better leader or a better employer, employee or going into um, a totally different country so that you get better perspective on cultures, et cetera. So I do think that, you know, women sometimes struggle with getting comfortable being uncomfortable where men just bring that confidence to the table and like I can do that right so absolutely which um, also leads me nicely into the, the next question how has failure played a role in your own leadership development how did you deal with it and also do you create the capacity for failure in your organization how do you do this it's a lot can you can you repeat let me write them yeah, down, so I'm, I'm sure them down. yeah so um how has, le how has failure played a role in your own leadership development and how did you deal with it? Okay. And then the second part is, do you create the capacity for failure in your organization? And how did okay. you do this? Okay. Okay. So failure, right? It's the, you know, it's the, it's the word, it's the, the word, the F word that doesn't, that's not really, uh, that's not really accepted and embraced in, 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 in careers, right? And in, in your job but you have to fail to learn you have to right and for me 
how has it worked in my leadership development is I I recognize that there's really like two types of decisions, right? There's decisions that you can make and you can take a risk and it's like, okay, because I can pivot away from that and it's not, you know, it's not, it's something that you can pivot away from and just keep going. And then there's other decisions that you, and risk that you can take where if you're wrong, it's, it's really hard to recover from it, right? It's hard to pivot away from it. You made a mistake. But at the end of the day, I think that if you're not failing, you're not learning, right? If you're not failing, you're not learning. How can you grow if you're right all the time, right? I don't understand that. So for me, anytime that I've made a mistake, anytime I've taken a risk that didn't work out, anytime I've failed, um, I always go back and assess and say, hey, what could I have done differently in that situation? Did I have all the information so that I don't repeat it? So I think it's okay to make mistakes, but it's the repeating of them and not learning from them that gets in trouble, gets you in trouble. And then for my team, you know, around the capacity to accept failure for my team, what I do is just make sure that I'm celebrating when they take a risk and it doesn't work as much as I'm celebrating these big successes, right? And I think as a leader, you have to have balance, right? Because I want, I mean, look at the light bulb, how many times it took Thomas Edison before he got it right, right? Was it 100 times and 99 times he failed and he said, I didn't fail, I actually learned. And the one time he got it right. So I think that in our teams as leaders, you have to create that environment where you know the difference between someone not having the skill set, not learning from mistakes and doing the same thing over and over, as opposed to, hey, let's take risks, let's try this, let's throw it, rapid experiment, let's throw it up against the wall, see if it sticks. And if it doesn't stick, you know, let's pivot away and do something else. So I'd say that, you know, that's the way I approach it for me personally and the way I approach it for my team as well. Brill, thank you. Is there still an element of engineering in your new role at Amazon Web Services? Not, not really. You know, it's it's interesting because um, I haven't had the title, the actual title of engineer since I think it was probably right around 90, 98, where oh. I've not had the title. I've not had the title of engineer, the the word engineer in my title, and um, I think it's my thought process, right? I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a title or a function for me anymore because I was groomed that way. I was groomed. My engineer, I would say, hey, my engineering brain, right? Hey, team, my engineering brain is thinking. <laughs> and so I think it's just it's just a way that you know my thought process works. That's different. The way that you know I look at situations, try to pull them apart, put them back together. That's probably you know more of the engineering at this point. But to be hands-on engineering, designing all that stuff. No. <laughs> do you miss it? I do sometimes. Um, you know, I am really a product focused kind of person, right? Again, to that visual. So I like to be, I love manufacturing. I love operations. I, when I was with the government doing research and development, Emma, I really struggled. That was a long time ago. I really struggled and I knew, <laughs> hey, I don't want to do research and development because, you know, every day you're just experimenting and experimenting. You may get something, you may not, and there's no product. And so I said, I can't do that. I need to go touch and feel and improve. So, you know, sometimes I do miss that element of it. But like I said, I do my best to spend a lot of time on the shop floor or in the shop, in the data centers, uh, talking to people, touching it, see, feeling it, seeing the processes um, to make sure that, you know, I'm understanding it and I'm getting that, you know, that jolt of energy, you know, from, from uh, the good old days of my engineering world. Definitely. Um, with with the, the amazing career that you've had, um, one of our audience members is asking about, do you have any daily habits um, that get you through your day? And I also want to know, you know, what does a day off look like for you? How do you unwind? Okay. If you Let unwind. <laughs> daily habits and unwinding. I'm just going to write them down so that I, I don't miss them. Okay. So daily yeah, habits. So, need, so daily I habits. Do, I'll start with daily habits first. Um, I do have daily habits. Like for me, um, I'm a very routine kind of person. Again, that engineering brain of mine. But I try my best to make sure I'm managing my time well. So before I go to bed at night, I look at my calendar, right? I'm like, and make sure. And then in the morning, I look at it again. And I think that the calendar and your career, right? It, it just, it, it says everything about where you're spending your time and where you should be spending your time. So I'm very careful about 
Um, you know, a lot of people love to be in meetings and they feel like that's a sense of accomplishment when they spent all day in meetings. So looking at my calendar every day to make sure at, at night before I go to bed and first thing in the morning when I wake up, but generally looking at my calendar just to make sure I'm spending my time in the right places, right? I don't want to spend my time in meetings and, you know, it's not necessary for me to be in every single meeting that, you know, my team's going to be in or that my boss is going to be in all this other stuff. So I'm very protective of that. I do try to work out. Um, in the morning before I start my day. I was one of the fortunate people. I, I've had my Peloton bike since like March of 2019. So I had it before the pandemic. So I do my best to ride it um, just to get going in the morning, just to get that energy going. So that's a that's a habit um, that, that I try to do. Easier said than done now during the pandemic uh, because I think I just get so distracted by all the snacks and uh, prefer to snack now instead of uh, working out, right? Um, so those are some of the habits that I have. It's just around making sure I'm managing my time correctly and making sure I'm leaning into the things that I know energize me for the rest of the day, like trying to work out in the morning. So for unwinding, I do unwind. You know, it's so funny. As, uh, I'm very informal and I do my best to try to unwind. And I'm not like always like 100% work. I unplug, right? I tell my team work-life balance. I'm like, you got to own it. I unplug. I take every single day of my vacation. You know, I'm always doing stuff. But what I do is, you know, you'll generally find me, you know, just on my sofa watching TV in the evenings and in the weekends. Well, normally before before COVID, I would pretty much travel somewhere every weekend. Right. I'd go to California, see my friends or I would try to get out of the country for every vacation, um, go to sporting events, live sporting events. So those things to unwind. So now I'm doing a lot of virtual stuff to stay like virtual wine tasting, virtual tours and stuff like that, um, just to, you know, just to unwind and stay plugged in since I can't really travel anymore. But I do definitely unwind. I hold I hold that standard hard for my team that, you know, you've got to take the time and you've got to re-energize and you got to recharge. Absolutely. Um, you'll be happy to know we've actually had a couple of questions all about living in Wales and wanting to know what was your favourite part about living in Wales. It's such an amazing country and I know that you hold a dealie as well as your heart. So yeah, what, what uh, you miss? <laughs> I miss the weather. No, I don't. <laughs> jokes it's uh, snowing today <laughs> yeah I, uh, it snowed here a couple of days ago it's supposed to snow here today too in dc but you know i missed the i missed the culture you know i missed the people i really enjoyed the welsh culture i enjoyed the food you know I, I love lamb it's just like one of my favorite dishes um i love rugby you know i love the sport i love um you know football the soccer part of football um, so I just think it was just really the culture and the people, you know, I had great experiences there. I always felt, you know, just embrace, you know, I, I got there and, you know, I just felt like uh, Wells just rolled out this big welcome net and said, hey, LaShawn, come and come and join our community. So there's a lot of parts of Wells that I missed, but I'd say it's everything that goes into that sense of community that I felt Wells there, whether it was the food or the, the, uh, the, the, the sport, but it, it was great in the people. So I miss it. I do miss it. I miss it quite a bit. And I'm happy to be an envoy because I can plug yeah. back into it. Definitely. And you have to come and visit us as soon as it's safe to do so. So I think we've probably got the most important question of the night now. Do you think <laughs> Wales could win the Six Nations? <laughs> yes, of course. You got to believe. You got to believe. I believe that we can win the Six Nations. So let's uh, let's just take down one 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 fixture at a time. So let's take down Scotland this weekend and then we'll keep going forward. Absolutely. I see a future as you as a, as a coach, as a Welsh coach in the future, so <laughs> look at Wales. <laughs> Definitely. Um, we've heard so much about your amazing career, LaShawn, and it really is impressive. So what does the future hold for you? What's next? You know, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things I tell people is just like, you got to define your own personal success, right? Don't get caught up in dreaming someone else's dream. And I just know what I'm passionate about and passionate for me is about, you know, quality of life, having fun, like doing things that I'm passionate about and having fun. So I've never had that three to five year plan. I really haven't. It drives, it drives HR crazy when I tell people that because that's the, one of the questions, what's your three to five year plan? I'm like, I didn't have one. Look at, look at my career path. You can see I didn't have one. I just always um, took jobs to learn, um, grow, and then add value back, you know, as a leader, tough, tough assignments. So I think um, what I'm focused on now, you know, there's a saying in uh, American baseball, and it can be the same in basketball and netball, all those other uh, uh, international sports. But 
says, you know, don't don't try to throw a ball before you catch it, right? And so for me, I'm focused on catching, you know, my current role in Amazon Web Services um, as Director of Infrastructure Operations here in Washington, D.C., before I try to throw it and move on to something else. So right now, I'm focused on, you know, the mission that I have in hand, at hand here. And then, you know, going forward, you know, we'll see where the next big challenge is and what I'm passionate about. And, you know, we'll keep plugging away and going forward from there. Well, fingers crossed, it may lead you back to Wales sometime soon. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I know that we've got a really mixed audience tonight at home and, um, you know, some still studying, some at the very beginning of their careers and some women wanting to progress their careers. So, Sean, leave us with your final tips and, and, and advice for those women at home. Okay. Well, I think the first one is have integrity in all you do, right? I always tell people that one, like nobody, nobody wants a cheat, a liar, or a thief on their team. And you don't want your brand defined by integrity gaps, right? So have integrity in all that you do. Um, some of the other ones I've, I've already hit on about, you know, define your own personal success. Don't let anybody else define that for you. You know, for some of you, you want to be a leader. For some of you, you don't. Some of you want to be an engineer. Some of you don't. Um, you got to define what makes you happy, what you're passionate about. I tell people, I'm like, you spend the majority of your life at work, right? So make sure you're happy and make sure you're passionate and don't, don't chase, don't get caught up in chasing somebody else's dream because when you catch it, you may find out that, you know, you're miserable instead of being happy, pursuing your own path. Um, we've talked about being confident in yourself. Another one I say is just get exposed to new things, right? Um, your dreams are only as big as what you're exposed to. Um, you can't dream big if you don't know how big your dreams can possibly be. So get exposure, go into new functions, new places, um, and allow yourself, be patient with yourself, allow yourself to make mistakes, um, change your mind, right? Just because you decide, hey, I'm going to be an engineer doesn't mean that 30 years later, you're not an engineering function anymore. You're doing something totally different. Um, and, you know, last but not least, I'll say, you know, have a strong network around you, you know, so that you're not suffering in silence. Things will get tough. You will face barriers. You will face obstacles. You will face roadblocks. Make sure you have that safety net, you know, of people around you that can pick you up from when you're on your knees and just trying to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you even put one foot in front of yourself, in, in front of the other for the next day? So those are, you know, just high level, some of the ones that I'd say, and um, make sure that, last but not least, I'll say, I said that was the last one, but this one's pretty passionate to me, is we have a social responsibility as diverse people to make the path better for people behind us. So rise up, reach back, rise up, reach back. You know, a lot of times people will start coming up that corporate ladder and they'll kick that ladder down, right? Even though they knew how hard it was for them to get onto that first rung of that ladder, and they forget to, to look back and, and, and reach back and, and pull people up with them. So for me, I have this bullish commitment that not only is I'm, am I keeping that ladder in place, I'm just hammering nails into it as I go up to make sure that that path and that ladder is there for everybody else um, who wants to come up and, and follow behind people like me. But um, so for me, I'd say high level, those are the things that the advice and tips that I give this amazing you know, group of, of, of folks that are attending the webinar today. Thank you so much. I'm sure you've inspired, I know you've inspired a lot of people at home. You've definitely inspired me. And we've already been having comments coming through uh, the chat function as well, saying thank you, LaShawn. It's been inspiring listening to you. Um, I just love the comment about not being able to, not throw the ball until you can catch it. I'm in a challenging role at the moment and I'm tempted to look elsewhere, but it has really made me reflect on whether I should stay and see the challenge through. So, yes, lots of LaShawn for president as well. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. You're so inspiring. So, absolutely. Oh, thank you echoing. so much, everyone. Oh, thank you. We're absolutely, absolutely in awe of you. You, you, you know, your achievements, your and your 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 personality as well. You're an absolute star. Um, and I could literally chat to you all night as well. Um, but we will let you get on. It is evening time here in Wales as well. So everybody going to bed soon. But um, thank you so much for your time today, Sean. It's been it's for been sure. amazing. It's been a delight to speak to you. And awesome. I know you've inspired so many people at home as well. Um, and yeah, so everybody at home, watch this space for our upcoming leadership events. We um, we will be coming back with leadership in around about April time. We're going to be looking at women leading transport here in Wales, and we'll have a, a great uh, list of uh, speakers for you as well. That's awesome. Um, 
just wanted to mention about LaShawn. So you can also add uh, quality rec record breaker to your list of achievements now as well. So you can pop that on the CV if you want to, um, which is amazing. Um, I mentioned earlier about Not Just For Boys. Not Just For Boys is one of our initiatives that we run at Quartig, um, hoping to inspire girls and women to think about careers within science, technology, engineering and maths. And we also run a program for, called Step to Non-Exec as well, um, providing women with a 12-month development program where they can shadow a board, receive mentoring, skills training, and get them on their way to becoming a board member then. Um, so we will be going live for applications in April. If anybody's interested in any of these initiatives, please drop me a line. Here are our contact details. You can reach out to us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and here's my contact details as well. So just drop me a line if you're interested in anything. I'm doing a bit of a whistle stop tour now because I know that we have overrun <laughs> slightly. But yeah, just want to take you back to LaShawn and just say a massive thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, you've been an absolute legend. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your Bye. evening. Thanks, everybody at home. Thank you for spending for sure. um, the last hour with us as well. So, yeah, I really hope that you've enjoyed the session. I found it really useful. There will be some feedback uh, questions popping up when I close the webinar. So, please, if you can just fill those out, that really does help us shape uh, events for the future. So, thank you, everybody, for taking part. Right. And good night. And I'll see you all, all right. soon. Thank and good you. Good afternoon, Sean. See you all soon. Right. Bye. Sure. See you all. <laughs>